Good morning. I and my wife are delighted to be with you uh, today. Um, I'm looking forward to this service. Pastor Dan said that you're his favorite over first service. So, no, he didn't. But, uh, um, but it is, it's a delight for me to be here. I, um, my pages of my message got all messed up. So it, this may not make sense today. Um, I should have looked at this before I came up here. There, okay, now we got it. Um, actually, that page isn't very good, so I could just take this one out. So that's the nice thing about preaching in two services is you know what works and what doesn't work. So, and it really didn't work, so would you just stand for the closing prayer? <laughs> I am, I'm in a different church every Sunday morning. Um, and, uh, um, and I see a lot of things and I like to, when I can share some positive things that I see that you may not see, um, because you're here all the time. And so a couple of things that I noticed right away is most churches say they're friendly, but I want you to know you really are not just friendly to each other. But, um, but I'm somewhat of an introvert, and I've been greeted way too much today. <laughs> like coming in your door this morning, there were so many guys standing out there just being nice and friendly and just having conversation. And uh, that doesn't always happen. You're blessed. What I saw today with 25 guys up here, first service and second service, I, I'm not sure there's another church in the Church of God in Illinois that would have that. Guys are absent. Um, and, and male leadership is so absent. And uh, that just was overwhelming. Um, they, we were talking at dinner last night. We had dinner with... Uh, pastors and spouses and and just had a wonderful time but they were saying hey we're not sure what it's going to be like tomorrow because we have like 20 guys just singing tomorrow and I want you guys to know my heart is so enriched for being here I'm going to record I recorded it especially that give us clean hands all these guys standing up here singing give us clean hands and pure hearts and humble us wow you know you can you can change the world this congregation you can change the world with 25 guys. I mean, Jesus had 12. <laughs> you got 25. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And uh, I just don't want you to take that for granted. I want you to just kind of park on that and celebrate it because that is really amazing. I recorded it, and I'm going to I'll put it on Facebook of my visit. I try to put it on our Illinois Ministries page on Facebook just because I want people to know what's happening around the state and the Church of God. And uh, so that video, it'll probably go viral and you'll probably make millions of dollars <laughs> off of it. <laughs> um, and it's good to be here on Mother's Day. It's an honor to, to be here. My wife doesn't always travel with me. If I, don't have a, if, if I don't have a meeting and I'm gonna go to a place and come back, she will go uh, and travel with me. But oftentimes I've got lots of meetings and sometimes they're messy. And so it was particularly nice just to have Lisa with me last night and to hang out with uh, your pastors and, uh, um, and just have some adult conversation. And so it was pretty special. It's Mother's Day. And I know Mother's Day can bring pain into some people's lives. As a matter of fact, even after the first service, somebody came up to me and said, man, thank you for your message, but this is a really painful day for me. And I get that. I do. Um, I also know that for some of you, it could be painful because you're not a mother and you really would like to be. And so this, this day can bring some emotions. Um, some of you may have teenagers and you're a mother and you wish you weren't, right? <laughs> Um, this day has a lot of emotions, but today I'm really going to try to celebrate the idea of family and, and mothers. 
For me, um, when I think of mothers, I, I think of my mom, and, uh, and these are the words or characteristics that come to me. My mom was the disciplinarian in the home. My dad was not. Uh, my dad was the soft guy. He was the, he was the big guy, but he was, a, he was a teddy bear. My mom, you didn't mess with her. She would take you out. My mom was also the cleaning lady. She was, she was the cleaning, can I use the word freak? She was like, she had to have everything clean. All of the lines in the shag carpeting, I'm old, in the shag carpeting had to go in the right way. They couldn't mix. Sometimes my sister and I were at the same age uh, of, of cleaning and we would have to switch off. We wouldn't even plug the vacuum cleaner in and run it. We would just run it in straight lines just, just so when she came home from work, the lines were straight and that's all that mattered. My mom was the main cook. She was the laundry lady. She was the baker. Uh, my mom was a nurse and doctor. She was the nurse and doctor of our home. She wasn't a nurse and doctor. Uh, she was a psychologist. She was a chauffeur. She was the molder of our vocabulary. If, if anybody in our home we were going to follow and it was appropriate, it would be my mom's vocabulary, not my dad's vocabulary. My dad's vocabulary, he was a sheet metal worker, and uh, his vocabulary, it, it was sometimes unacceptable to my mother. And so we had to take her vocabulary, not his. She was a late night counselor. She would on purpose stay up late and wait for us to get home, not to see if we miss curfew, because none of us really are, the, well, my sisters did, but my brother and I, we didn't really miss curfew a whole lot. And so when we got home, mom would be waiting, and it was usually because she knew that we would open up, it seems like we would open up after 10, 30, 11 o'clock, and she would be there just to be able to talk to us and listen to us. Mom was the one in the family that pretended to hate the family dog, but we caught her at times loving the dog, but she would never let anyone know. My mom was the original link that I had to what God's love was like, that unconditional, always in my corner kind of love. She was also the one that would say, I brought you into this world, I can, yeah, your mom too. So we're thinking about moms today. I'd like to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. This is a mom that deeply loved her two sons, James and John. You will know James and John as two of the three that Jesus hung, that, that Jesus was closest to, Peter, James, and John. It would be pretty spectacular if Jesus was walking this earth and two of your sons were his closest friends. That'd be, I mean, that, that'd be a pretty cool thing. We know her as, we know James and John as the sons of Zebedee, so I'm calling her Mrs. Zebedee today. Mother, Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and knelt down before them and asked a favor of Jesus. I want to stop there because I, I, I want to tell you that something that I picked up being in church with you this morning is this is a church that really loves Jesus. You say, well, doesn't every church really love Jesus? I pick things up when I go in and visit different churches. Like there are some churches that really love their church. They really love being together. They love each other. But one of the things that just come to my mind when, I, when I'm watching first service, second service, in between services, you really love Jesus too. Like your conversations are not about, are, are, well, we did, I did have a couple of conversations about baseball, but, but <laughs> they're about Jesus. Like the conversations that I had after the first service, they were about Jesus. And when you see these, these men up here singing uh, how he loves us, and, and it's, it's, a, it's just a place that I'm convinced 
I mean, maybe some of you are in that questionable question stage, but the majority of you just really love Jesus and you're living for him. And, uh, and that's, that's just really cool. Um, then the mother of Zebedee came and she knelt down before Jesus with her two sons and Jesus said to her, what do you want? What, what, is, it, what is it that you want? Why, why are you kneeling here? You're the mother of my two buddies. What, what, are, what are you doing? And she said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? James and John said, we can. And Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant these places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. Undoubtedly, Mrs. Zebedee had heard of this idea of a kingdom. And she knew that Jesus was going to rule and reign in that kingdom, but she was thinking it was going to be this physical kingdom that that they were going to overcome and Jesus would be the ruler. And she was saying, I would like your two best buddies here if they could sit next to you and rule with you. She wasn't thinking of a spiritual kingdom like we would think of it today, but she was thinking of it as a physical kingdom. And she wanted her, her two sons to have that depth of connection with the kingdom of God. It was a strange request as we read the text just on surface, but I believe the request was born out of maybe a story or something that she had gained after reading it. it if we jumped ahead to Matthew chapter 21, we would read a parable of the tenants. And the parable of the tenants is a, a property owner hired some men to work all day in his fields, and he agreed to pay them, let's say he agreed to pay them $100. But he knew the work wasn't getting done, so he hired some more men at noon, and he agreed to pay them $100. And then it still wasn't getting done, so he went and he hired some more in the evening, and he agreed to pay them $100. So by the end of the day, all the work got done, but everybody got $100, the ones that worked all day, the ones that worked from noon to the end of the day, and ones who worked the shortest amount of time. And obviously the question is, how's that fair? I wonder if sometimes this story had caught on with Mrs. Zebedee, and she wanted to make sure that her, her sons were, were in their proper place, reminding Jesus that they had been with him since he, he asked them to follow him. It must have. <laughs> Honey, will you help me shut my watch off during. I don't know how to do it. It keeps asking me questions, and I found this on the wet line. Like, she even knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> this must have caused Mrs. Zebedee to, to wonder what kind, you know, her sons are following Jesus and what kind of authority are they going to have when the kingdom actually does come? It's pretty easy to maybe criticize Mrs. Zebedee for her forthrightness. But since today is Mother's Day, I'd, I'd kind of like to just focus on maybe the positive thoughts from what she brought to the table in this, almost in a admirable way, uh, a typical mom's love kind of way. I mean, what mom doesn't want their best for their kids? And I think that's what we're dealing with with Mrs. Zebedee. She's wanting what's best for her kids, wanting what she feels like they may have coming to them. We also need to recognize that when she came to Jesus, while Jesus did not say, okay, he didn't deny the request either. He just simply said, it's not up to me who sits at my right and my left. So I want to point out three things because it's a sermon and sermons have three points sometimes. <laughs> the first thing I point out is Mrs. Zebedee wanted her kids to be a part of the kingdom. She wanted her 
kids to be a part of the kingdom. I can think of no more important task of motherhood or being a parent than to seek to ensure that your children are part of the kingdom. I don't think there's another thing that would top that as a parent is to make sure your children, everything within your power, to help them to know God. I know that many mothers pray. Sometimes they pray out of necessity. Sometimes they pray out of worry. Sometimes they pray because being a mom or a parent is just not easy. We, our oldest daughter, her name is Erica. She's a first grade teacher. She has two boys. One of the boys uh, is seven or eight, eight, seven, second grade. second grade. That's the easiest one. And her youngest is four. He is exhausting. The four-year-old is absolutely exhausting. We had, Lisa has him every Monday through Thursday. She has him in the mornings. And uh, he, he's a joy. Um, he's funny. When, when he comes in in the morning, it used to be that I would say, come here and give Grandpa a hug. And he would run to Lisa instead. And so finally, I got, I got this idea that when he comes in, I just say, hey, Lincoln, don't, don't bother me today. I really don't want a hug. And so then he comes and he jumps on me. And uh, so the other day he was in the living room and I said, Lincoln, come in here and give Papa a hug. And he walks in the living room right up to my chair and he goes, okay, not today. Okay, not today. Okay, not today. He is full of life and he is exhausting. My daughter's also finishing up her master's in education. And uh, it was her birthday last week, so she and her husband went out of town Friday night, and we watched the two boys. During that time, we found out that she had forgot to get somebody to go over to her house and let the dogs out. And it was supposed to be my daughter, but then she didn't, my other daughter, and she didn't have time, so she called and said, Dad, would you go over and let the dogs out? And so, uh, by default, I went over to let these dogs out. And uh, when Erica found out that I was the one to go let the dogs out, she quickly texts me and she said, Dad, I am so sorry you had to do that. The dogs could have stayed in their cages at kennels another couple of hours. We're on our way home. I'm so sorry that the, the, uh, the house was a mess and I didn't have time to clean it. I'm so sorry that you saw the house like that. And, uh, and, and it, it was a mess. Um, but, <laughs> but I text back and I said to her, you're a school teacher, you work full time, you have two boys, one is exhausting, you're finishing up your capstone project for your master's. Honey, I don't know how you have time to do anything. The time for a clean house is coming. It's about 15 years away. <laughs> but once it's there, you're going to have a clean house. Lisa and I have been empty nesters for quite a while now. Our kids are grown. They have kids of their own. And, and our house is clean. You can stop by most every, almost any time, and we, you would be welcome to come in. Because our house, it's, it's always, well, except for when Lincoln's there. But, <laughs> but as soon as he leaves, it's clean again. I mean, our bathrooms are clean. The kitchen's clean. It, the dishes aren't stacked up. And, and we're... We've been married 38 years, going on 39 years. It's clean. We got it. But what I remember is all those times when it wasn't clean, when the girls were young, and I would be angry because the house wasn't clean. And I would be angry that, that their toys were all in the garage and I couldn't park my car in the garage. And I'd be angry that as they got older, their cars were in my parking places and I had to park out in the street and had to take 10 extra steps. Oh my goodness. And... I mean, I remember all that, but you know what? Now the house is clean and I can park wherever I want and they're gone. And I think of all that time that I wasted being angry because there were toys in the place where I park. Now, I don't want to go back to the days where the house was a mess. 
but I sure would love to go back and redo some of my own attitudes. Because the most important thing for me now as I get older and I look back is do my kids know Jesus? I mean, I know they know, I know they know that I like a clean house. I mean, I got a 35-year-old daughter apologizing that her house wasn't clean to her dad. They know, they know that dad likes a clean house. But do they know do they know that the most important thing for me is I want them to know Jesus? Mrs. Zebedee wanted that. She, she wanted her sons to be a part of the kingdom. What good is it if our children are successful in making money and driving fine cars and living in good neighborhoods if they don't know God? What does it matter if they gain the whole world but lose their souls? What does it matter if they travel the world but they never, they never connect with Jesus? Being a parent is not easy. It's difficult. And Mrs. Zebedee gives us a good example. She prayed earnestly that her sons would be part of his kingdom. Secondly, she prayed that her sons would not only just be part of the kingdom, but they would work in the kingdom too. Um, sometimes pastors don't want their kids to grow up and work in the kingdom, like become a pastor, because they know that um, you know sheep most of the time are well behaved, but sometimes sheep bite. And, uh, and, and it's like, I don't know if I want my kids to, to go through some of the things that pastors go through. And, and I know I kind of have those feelings as well that I'm not sure if I want. My, my daughter's been asked to, to become a youth pastor at the church that she goes to. And, and I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want her to do that because I know how parents can be. And I know how church leaders can be over youth leaders, and I don't know if I want her to hear all the stuff that youth leaders have to hear, but I sure want her to be a part of the kingdom. And I don't want to be the one, I want to protect her, but I don't want to be the one in the way. Mrs. Zebedee just didn't pray for their souls, but she wanted more. She wanted more. Churches are so full of people just content to fill a seat there are plenty of people willing to sit back and receive the message or receive the blessing. But it's another thing when people jump in and come all in and do some of the real work of being a disciple. I was thinking about this recently. The, the greatness of any church, the greatness of any church will be measured by how many people that we're sending out into ministry Monday through Saturday, not the seating capacity. It's the greatness of a church is when is when this is kind of a gathering time, a huddle time. But when you leave this place, it's where all of us are engaged in the kingdom work. Mrs. Zebedee not only prayed for her children to know God, but she wanted them involved in the work of the kingdom. And that can be done in so many different ways. All of us are called, all of us are called to have an impact, an influence, a ministry in our world. And then the final thing Mrs. Zebedee did is she had big expectations. Like she didn't ask that her sons just sing in the choir. She wanted them sitting next to Jesus. She had big expectations. She didn't pray that the children would just be doorkeepers. She wanted them at the right hand and the left hand. When you're working in a kingdom, it, some of us may have seen this just in, uh, in, with the crowning of the new king of England. It, it, you see all the pomp and the circumstance, and, the, and it, it matters who's to the right and to the left. If you know that, it, it, the, the press is always talking about, well, where is this person seated? And why is the queen over here? And why is the princess over there? And they have to sit in the third row. And, and, and the, the one son that's, that's married to the actress, that, which one is that? George? No. Harry. Poor Harry. He, he had to sit behind his brother. You know, and, and it matters where people are sitting, right? 
Mrs. Zebedee comes right out and she said, I, I, want, I want mine next to Jesus. No higher position. You know, we may consider Mrs. Zebedee at first reading this text a little brash, maybe a little presumptuous. Maybe, maybe she's, you know, you read it and, and she's like the soccer mom who thinks her kid is better than anybody else and that kid should get more playtime than the other kids. Or maybe she's, she's a mom that's always at the school thinking that her kids should have got a better score on the test than what the teacher gave that child. I have to tell you, I admire her boldness. I admire her boldness. I, I actually admire her humility of coming and just kneeling before Jesus. Too often we've settled for kind of a mediocrity. We're content with just barely making it through the door. For too long we've been content to just sit back and hope things happen. A couple of months ago, I, I lead a small group of regional pastors or state pastors and there's 14 of us that gather every Thursday morning at 9 a.m. And uh, they're from all over the United States. And uh, I, I run the group, and so, or I facilitate the group. And uh, one, one of the mornings we met, I asked this question, hey guys, what's heavy on your heart today? And the Spirit just broke out, and every one of us began to share the closest things on our heart today. They were about our kids. You know, we have, here we are, the regional pastors, and we have all these situations that we're dealing with and pastors who are leaving faster than we can replace them. And um, uh, not all churches have pastors who've been here for 20 years. And it's very difficult to find pastors right now. When I started this job 14 years ago, if a church was looking for a pastor, they'd have about 10 resumes that they could choose from. Today, every pastor that's looking for a church, he has about 10 churches looking for, uh, looking for a pastor. It's, it's, sw it's swapped. I tell churches today, if you get a name that's looking, that's of a pastor that's looking, you better take it because you may not get another name for a year. That's how, that's the leadership crisis and all of us regional pastors are facing that. All denominations are facing that. But the number one thing that we came together and shared was what's closest to our heart was praying for our kids. And all of us have adult children. So what I'd like to do today at the end, for the closing is I would like to invite you into my devotional time in the morning. Like, like I would grab a cup of coffee, I'd have my Bible, I'd have a devotional, my journal. And today I'd like to just pray for my kids. And I'd like to invite you to be a part of that. Almost as if we're going to have devotions together and you're just going to hear me pray for my kids. So I model it, not that you don't know how to pray, not that you don't know, but I, I, I just want to be... Uh, vulnerable and authentic with you to say, hey, my kids are adults, 35, almost th 35 and 31 almost. And they're both married and they have, they have children of their own. Someone after the first service stopped me and said, sounds like your kids are awesome. And I, and I said, I think they're awesome, but let me correct if you're assuming they're perfect. They're, they're adults and they're great human beings, but I still pray that they passionately know God and they never give up and they're always influencing the kingdom. I mean, I, Lisa and I are, are blessed with, with our kids, but in no way were they perfect growing up and no way was our family without struggles. Um, and no, we, had, we had some dark nights of the soul uh, with our with our girls, and uh, so I don't want to give the impression that my kids are perfect and that everything is just wonderful. Um, I have an older I, my oldest daughter. She goes to church primarily because she wants her kids connected to the church, but she's been hurt by the church. And if it was up to her, I'm not sure if she would even go. Just just because 
She's like, I, I, I just don't really like those people. But she wants her kids to be in the church, and so she's struggling with this, all of that stuff. So our kids are there. It doesn't matter how old they are. Um, when, when our kids were growing up, James Dobson was writing books a lot when our kids were right, when our kids were growing up, like he was kicking one out every month about how, you know, how to raise perfect kids and how to be the best dad in the world. And, and I thought if I got one more of his books, I just would like to throw it across the room because none of his stuff was working in my life. Right. So I'm with you parents who are struggling and parents who are, are praying and, and their kids don't want somebody stopped me after the first service and they said, man, it just really encouraged me to pray for my kids because I've got one kid. <laughs> and I have the gift of discernment, so I knew exactly what he was saying. <laughs> so I want to just pray for my kids, model it, and uh, hopefully it'll encourage you to pray for, for your kids. First service, I prayed for my grandkids. This service, I want to pray for my kids and their husband. Would you join me in prayer? Father, thank you for our time together. And Lord, as I come before you, as, as, as I have so many times, really for over 30 years, just lifting these two names of my daughters to you, Erica and Kayla. Adults now with children of their own. But my prayer for them has not changed. My prayer for them is I want them to be part of the kingdom of God. I want them to know you and for you to know them. I want, I want for them to know the fullness of walking with a Savior. I want them to be confident in who they are. And I pray that for their husbands as well, for Kyle and for Cody. Lord, I ask that the four of them, as they as they serve this, the next generation of our family, that the most important thing to them, above athletic competitions and scholarships and art and anything else, I pray, Father, that, that they would know you. I pray, Father, that my kids would love the service, being in the service of the Master. Lisa and I, for, for our life of 60 years, we're, we just love being in the service of the Master. We're privileged to be able to serve you in so many different ways over our lifetime, but we want the same for our kids. We want, Lord, for our kids to enjoy serving you. So give them a passion, Lord, to not only know you, but to serve you and to walk with you. And then we pray for their influence. God, I, I thank you that every year our daughter Erica gets to touch the lives of 20 or so first graders. That she spends so much quality time with these first graders. I pray that they would know the love of Jesus through Erica that they would always remember that Mrs. Hibbler loved them more than what she taught them, but they, they would know that she loved them. And for Kayla and all the influence that she has, whether it's with teenagers or her own children or neighborhood kids or the people that, that are drawn to Kayla because of her sweet nature, I pray that, that they would know that the love that Kayla has for them is because of how much Jesus loves her and how much she loves Jesus. And I pray that both of the girls and their husbands would find joy in the service of the Master. And I pray that they would change the world. I know that's a big expectation, and it sounds like, it sounds like James and John's mom. I have big expectations for my four kids. I want them to change the world, their world, influence the people around them. So I pray that Kyle and Cody and Erica and Kayla would know you, that they would find joy in the service of the Master, and that they would change their world because of their love for you. 
Lord, Lisa and I never claimed to be perfect. We, we certainly didn't get a lot of things right. She got a lot more things right than I did. But I'm thankful that you were able to take what we could offer to you in our own brokenness and to do our best in teaching our kids these important things. So today we speak Jesus over our families. We speak Jesus over our children and their families. May you rule supremely as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It doesn't matter where we sit in the kingdom. We just are thankful to be a part of it. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.